This is Soundstage founder Doug Schneider. You're listening to the Soundstage Audiophile podcast, your semi-regular deep dive into news, facts, opinions, and anecdotes about everything that really matters in the world of high-performance audio. Hosts Brent Butterworth and Dennis Berger have more than five decades worth of audio product testing experience and a few hours of podcasting experience as well. Now, here's Brent and Dennis. Hello, you are listening to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast, and I am Brent Butterworth, editor of Soundstage Solo. And I'm Dennis Berger, editor of Soundstage Access. And we are always here to present you with the latest and greatest and most interesting news going on in the world of audio. But this is a very, very special Soundstage Audiophile Podcast because we have with us today a very, very ultra mega special guest, the most special guest we could possibly have (laughs) in the world of audio, a man that I recently called the Taylor Swift of audio punditry (laughs) and and to whom I gave, I I think we should do, we should let people guess who this is going to be, although they'll probably see it in the thing, but but, so I, I used to work with this guy and he went to a press event and it was some new thing. It was really great. And he came back and he's like, eh, it was nothing. And I said, if you went to the press event for Thomas Edison introducing the light bulb, you just said, what's wrong with candles? And ever <laughs> since then, his nickname, he, his name to me, he's had a nickname, but his name to me has been Steve What's wrong with candles, Guttenberg? <laughs> yeah. Welcome, now, Steve. <laughs> welcome, Steve. It now, to me, yeah. <laughs> I think to me, Steve is probably best known for his work on the 2006 uh, 10, 10 best Chesky recordings that we worked on together. The three True. of us did that. Uh-huh. I don't yeah. think I don't think we've actually all been together since then, have we? And that was that was 2006. That was a long time ago. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But here we are what are now. we talking about this week, guys? So we're going to start with a discussion that uh, is actually was was brought up by uh, an article. Not wait, Steve doesn't write articles anymore. What am I thinking? <laughs> I'm so old school. <laughs> Steve has Steve has one of the most popular YouTube channels on audio. It's called the Audiophiliac. Mm-hmm. Go check it out on YouTube. And so Steve recently did an interview with Professor Edgar, Sh- Edgar Showeri of Princeton University about his spatial 3D audio technology, which is also called Bach, B-A-C-C-H, and I don't know what that stands for, Um, but Steve probably does. And so we're going to discuss that with Steve, and then, Dennis, we're going to discuss something else with Steve, right? Yeah, I figure for the second segment, we'll just open it up the discussion to Steve and be like, dude, what do you want to talk about? Because like I said, the three of us have got some catching up to do. We haven't all been together in a long time. So we're just going to be like, hey, Steve, floor is yours, buddy. What do you want to talk about? Um, I can't wait. Yeah. So what about what about our third segment? So for our third segment, we are going to talk about two reviews that are on Soundstage Simplify. And they're both by Gordon Brockhaus, and one of them is of the SVS Prime Wireless Pro powered speakers. The other one is of the Totem Kin Play powered speakers. And these are both powered speakers. And so it's kind of a big trend, and we want to talk about kind of the pros and cons of that and look at what Gordon said about them and and uh, try to sort of get our finger on the pulse of what's happening with powered speakers. And since they're wireless, Steve hates them, so Steve's going to duck out for that part of the segment. <laughs> Yeah, I love <laughs> Yeah, but first, yes, let's talk about this Bach thing, guys. Okay, so Steve, you want to introduce us to, since you know far more about this than we do, you want to introduce us? Well, and since you did the video us? about it, yeah. yeah, you did a video about <laughs> that's it. it. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I know. Now, I've known Edgar probably, I don't know, eight, nine years. First, because he loaned Chesky Records the binaural head that was used on most of those sessions. And in the early sessions, Mm -hmm. he was there helping out and taking us through it kind of deal. So, you know, Edgar is a rocket scientist, literally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, he has a lab at Princeton University, and he does basically uh, propulsion for rockets, but not, you know, with burning fuel with, uh, what do you call it, when you take energy, you you take electricity and you turn it into force. 
for deep space yeah. missions. Mm. You can tell I'm not a rocket scientist. But anyway, that's, yeah. his, that's his real thing. No one yeah. confused you with a rocket scientist. No, I can promise you that. <laughs> Oops. Anyways. I don't know. He kind of looks like the rocket scientist from uh, Independence Day a little bit. I guess he does. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you've outed me. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, oh. Edgar's got the, you know, Edgar's a rocket scientist, but he loves audio. I mm -hmm. mean, in this video, we talked about it when he was a little kid. I think, no, for his 14th birthday, he got a surround, a quadraphonic system. <laughs> and he had mm. one recording. <laughs> what was it? It was, uh, it was a jazz record. I can't remember which one. And he only had this one quadraphonic recording that all he listened to was, was that one thing. You know? Well, now that that's because he ain't from around here, right? He ain't from around here. <laughs> Where is he from? from? Uh, oh God, you ask the tough questions. You're a journalist, man. I think he's from uh, <laughs> Lebanon, but I could be wrong. But anyway, so he 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 was bitten by the surround bug, and he's never gotten over it. But it's the thing about he's trying to take two channel recordings and make them into surround sound or immersive audio, as it's now called. Are you, mm -hmm. are you guys offended by that word, immersive audio? It sounds no. like they're repackaging surround sound. It sounds like a hipper way of saying surround sound. So 1970s or 80s or 90s or aughts. Well, they had to come up with something new to call it since yeah. they're trying to like kind of relaunch it. So yeah, they're adding so, another axis sure. to it, I guess. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Axis, I, right. Yeah, we like it. The Z and you don't. axis. Hey, Brent, remember <laughs> Dolby ProLogic Z? Yes, I remember it. Okay. <laughs> it was, you know it was I a remember thing. it. It was a thing for about it five minutes. It was never minutes. really a thing. I was being generous. <laughs> five minutes. Yeah. So anyway, Edgar takes two channel recordings and makes them into immersive audio. Now, it does involve putting uh, microphones in your ear canals, and he does measurements, or the processor does me measurements. And I think that's part of the reason it works so well. It's not a mm -hmm. one-size-fits-all kind of deal. You, the subject, have to be part of the formula here. Yeah. But anyway, it works incredibly well. I mean, it's... Uh, especially with minimally mic'd recordings, like Chesky Records recordings, not just the binaural ones, but any of the ones that David's been making for uh, 30 or so years... They sound amazing. Like I was listening okay. to this one recorded yeah. at RCA Studio A in the city, and mm -hmm. it just brought back the room, not just the performer, uh, the whole Kenny Rankin, because of you. It's a phenomenal recording. It's one of the really early Chesky's yeah. done in this huge studio. You could record a symphony orchestra in that space. And uh, I'm listening to it, and not in all this time since have I listened to that recording and felt the room itself that Kenny Rankin was singing in as clearly wow. as that. That's how amazing it was. So take us through the process. What does the system actually look like? I mean, what do you when you do his system, what happens? Well, he he talks about crosstalk cancellation. Now he's not saying that he thought of crosstalk cancellation. He's just taking the, the process of it further. Mm -hmm. But before I knew Edgar, back in my days at Sound by Singer in New York City, we used to use, uh, I'm sorry to use this word again, analog crosstalk cancellation mm -hmm. by using a basically a wall that extended from between the left and right speakers and went up to your nose. That's called crosstalk cancellation. Yes. Wow. And it I know. works really well. But its wife acceptance factor, or spouse acceptance factor, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, have to, I, have to, I just have to say that there was a, a, a an audio writer whose name I never mentioned because he threatened to sue me. But um, uh, a couple times. But uh, he referred to that as stoogephonics. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which, you know. But it works. It does work. And it's cheap. But you're not going to sit there with your nose pressed against a wall and have All a, a right. wall you don't have in the middle of your. I mean, come on. against it, but you know, in the vicinity. So, yeah. And it works. Anyway. So anyway, so. Edgar has created an electronic, a DSP version of the wall, so you don't have to, sorry, mm -hmm. build a wall between your speakers. Edgar does it yes. for you virtually. 
So it works with two. So this this basically works with two channel systems and makes them sound like what? Surround sound. S- immersive audio. No surround sound. Yeah. <laughs> immersive audio. <laughs> uh, it doesn't. So does it sound better than a normal two channel system? What is? Wait, how would you define better? More more spacious, more realistic, more more, oh, more, more you spatially are there? realistic. Yes. That with a with a Chesky recording with a well not just a Chesky but any minimally yeah. mic recording or you know classical recordings from the fifties and sixties and maybe mm-hmm. into the seventies any recording there there wasn't a forest of microphones that was multi channel it does a very good job of doing that yeah now if you take Led Zeppelin or mm-hmm. any studio recording done multi channel the the uh, there's like a randomization for lack of a better word of where instruments appear in this uh, Bach uh, decoded recording. Yeah. Mm. So, but it can be really cool, but it, it, it bears no relationship to a reality of how instruments would be laid out, which is okay because they weren't laid out in the first place. Yeah, I mean, well, like, w- what would reality, like, how would you map reality onto something like the Hendrix experience is crosstown traffic, right? Right. I mean, especially when you've got like Dave Mason and Noel Redding moving back and forth across the soundstage, like like they're on roller skates or something. I mean, <laughs> wh- what would it do with something like that? But more importantly, like, what does any of that have to do with reality? I mean, so much of the music that we listen to is not intended to recreate reality. It's it's almost like you're comparing a photograph to a painting or something. Good point. So. Yeah, you're right. So, but anyway, but people, some people have this craving to be freed from the limitations of two speakers. Mm-hmm. Right? They want that bigger sound. Yeah. Immersive, surround, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I like listening to a stereo system that sounds bigger and wider and deeper than the actual locations of the two speakers. I do. Mm-hmm. Sure. I, I yeah, admit to that. We all do, I think. Yeah. Right. This takes it many steps further. And that's exciting. It's really interesting. And I give him credit for doing it and, and working on it, just like you know, pounding away year after year. And, uh, and by the way, one of the things he, he points out, which I don't know the usefulness of this idea, but it is interesting, that you don't have to have the left and right speakers being symmetrical to the listener. Oh, you could actually have them that. at right angles or something. It doesn't matter. Anymore. Because you're measuring, he first measures what's going on in the listener's ears with those microphones. Right. So if the speakers are off, the microphones pick it up and compensate for it. Right. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. and by the way, there's also head tracking. So it doesn't matter mm. really where you are either. I mean, up to a point. But you yeah, could be the, way the off feature axis. Steve, yeah, the feature Steve Guttenberg's been waiting all these years for, head tracking. Yeah. <laughs> I live for that. I really yeah. do. So, uh, no, it's, I mean, it's it's fascinating, you know? You know, I was at an AES show, an Audio Engineering Society show, I don't know, certainly pre-COVID. And there was mm-hmm. a guy there who was talking about, in the future, oh, I think he had a time frame, 50 years from now, we would no longer be listening to speakers. Everything would be headphone based and you could create immersive sound over headphones and do things, you know, with DSP and blah, 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 that just like set the engineers and the musicians free to do anything spatially and just have headphones because the idea of doing it over speakers in a room will just become outdated, basically. Hmm. But how does that work with the sort of the shared listening experience? Well, we're multiple yeah, I mean, people wearing headphones. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. Got you there. <laughs> but it, yeah, I mean, I guess, but then they can't interact with one another. I mean, they're sure like, you, can. At you that touch point. like you do right now on a Bose or a Sony, you touch the side, <laughs> you can't turn it to live sound, whatever it's called. And there you go. But don't be such a Luddite, Luddite to ask. Come on. Uh, don't, you know. be, it's, don't stand in the way of progress. But, <laughs> but, but wait a second. You know what I think? I think the future of sound reproduction at home, spatial, is mm-hmm. that pretty much your floor, your the walls, your ceiling, all of it could be speakers, right? That yeah. it could just be, let's say, embedded into the surfaces of your room to create f- from a- the actual interaction of the room itself and, you know, cancel the effects of the room and just 
create a a space in your room of the original venue or what the let's say the artist's yeah. intent. I think there's an inevitability of that. Remember that company called uh, NXT? Of course, yeah. yeah. They made and flat what did panel they speakers. Do? Yeah, they made speakers that basically had an exciter that would excite the diaphragm. And there mm-hmm. it was. It didn't have to be a cone. It could be any shape. They, they were going to put it in cars, like the dashboard, or anything could be the speaker. So some, some better version of that. Hmm. hmm. What do you think? I mean, I don't disagree with you. I have two comments to make. Um, it's going to mean changing the construction of people's homes. Is that right? Well, let's say, and, let's make it simple. Let's say it's like the equivalent of wallpaper. It's not. Oh, okay. You know. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and, you know, if the wallpaper can you know, stand out somehow a little bit, I mean, somebody could do that. And things like that kind of have been done. Um, my Didn't question Sony for you, though, make a TV where the entire screen was did. a speaker? They did. They're still and, doing it. Yeah, they're high end stuff now. Yeah, yeah. You, you basically can use the TV as your center channel. So, right. And does right. it sound good? I haven't heard it. I, ah. I've heard people say that it sounds good, but I've heard a lot of people say a lot of things, you know, basically. Yeah, sure. It's sort of like what we talked about in the last episode. If the press release says it, some journalist is going to parrot it. So yes. I don't know. I haven't heard it for myself. It sounds glassy. Oh, <laughs> All right. That's it. Episode over. Get out. Oh, I, think it's, I, I think it sounds smooth. Transparent. Um, oh. Yeah, transparent. Wow. Um, but so let me ask you this though. Uh, so, so Professor Shuary, where has he gotten in terms of commercializing this product? Can you go buy it today? You can buy his physical processor, which is really, yeah. really expensive, like fifty thousand dollars. But then he wow. has like a software version, which is a lot less. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different ways it goes. I mean, he's trying to license it to various companies and stuff, yeah. but all that is, you know, is complicated. Just not because the technology is complicated; it's just dealing with all that stuff is complicated. So sure. Yeah. I think somebody like Trinov should look into buying it. You know, because Trinov's doing a lot of interesting things with their room optimizer that I think would be complementary with this in a lot of interesting ways. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, especially that one of the things that they can do c- kind of pretty well, I mean, you, not so much in stereo, but in a surround sound situation with their, if you have their, their super, super, super expensive directional mic, you can basically relocate the sound of your speakers. So if you've got one speaker in particular that you can't place optimally, Trinov can basically relocate that through use of, you know, delays and cross mixing with other speakers and things like that. So they, they, to a degree, they're doing it in stereo, but it doesn't work as well from what I've heard. But yeah, I think if you took a system like Trinov and combined it with something like this, that could be p- p- pretty magical. And let's face it, the Trinov stuff is already super expensive anyway. So yeah. it might be a good match. You see, I th- seriously, I think the problem with immersive audio is or atmos or whatever you want to call it is the aesthetic of it that Mm. in in the two in the early 2000s when people were trying to figure out how to mix multi-channel music there was no consensus they could never come to a consensus even for simple things like the vocal is hard in the center channel no yeah matter of fact when the dylan sacds came out Sometimes the vocal is hard in the center channel. Sometimes it was phantom, left, right, right? So even for a given artist's work, they couldn't even make it consistent within that, you know? And where were the surround speakers? They weren't in the, in the Dolby Digital position. I, I, Brent might remember better what the positions were supposed to be for DVD audio and SACV, <laughs> but it wasn't what was used for yeah. movies. And right. were they at ear really height stupid. or above you? So... Yeah then those problems existed and those weren't technical problems that was the the people that were making the records couldn't figure out what to do with it and you know what that that might actually this might actually be a really good place to take our our discussion for our second segment do you guys want to take a break real quick maybe get a drink of water listen to some music and and sort of dive down that alley and talk about 
the the Let's sort of immersive that. and atmos and stuff like I that. I agree. Yeah. If, if if I don't know, it depends on what Steve wants to talk sure, about. Sure, no, let's. Uh... I'm in. Okay. I'm game. We're we're leaving it open to Steve. Steve Steve is is in. Steve is the editor. He's the guest editor today. He I'm is the in master of, of reality. That's what I am. That's right. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's take a little break, get some water, and come back, and we'll we'll dive deeper into that. Cool. Back to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. I'm Dennis Berger. And I'm Brent Butterworth. And I'm Steve Guttenberg. <laughs> ah, there you go. There we go. <laughs> the audiophilia. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. So for our second segment, I want to pick up a discussion that kind of we started toward the end of the last one. Steve, you were you were starting to go down a road of talking about immersive <laughs> audio immersive. and and at and atmos and things like that. So Let's pick up that conversation and go from there. I, I'm just I'm curious what you what you think of Atmos in general and specifically for music. Uh I, I like that you added specifically for music. Uh <clears throat> because in my time at CNET, when I had to review Atmos soundbars and stuff, it was not it was not the best of times <laughs> for me. Mm. And I used to, the, the one that I used to rely on was Gravity, the movie, because that one really used Atmos a lot. <laughs> I mean, it was sort of dependent on Atmos, so it worked very well for that movie. Mm-hmm. But in so many other movies that I had to cover, I used in reviews of speakers and receivers and stuff, it was like, did people really care about this? I don't know. Well, but some, some people, some people do. Yeah, some people do. I found it. I have found it off-putting for the very longest time. But I would say, just in the past year, movie mixers have finally started to learn how to do Atmos. And there are like three mixes in particular I can think of. Last Night in Soho, Nightmare Alley, and uh, the new George Miller movie, 3,000 Years of Longing. And I think what makes them work for me and what made older Atmos movie mixes not work for me is it seemed in the past it was always about making sound stick to your walls and ceiling, right? Mm. And there was no real sense Mm. of space. But like 3,000 Years of Longing in particular, there's a scene early in it where they're in a lecture hall and the, the voices are reverberating off of the ceiling and then off of the rear wall behind you. But what's interesting in the past, I think that would have just sort of made it sound like it was reverberating in your room what they're doing now is learning to do delay in such a way that it transformed the room into a much larger space and with nightmare alley there was like a thunderstorm scene and instead of sounding like there's thunder coming from like the upper left hand corner of my room (laughs) all of a sudden it sounded like thunder was two miles away so now that they're figuring that out i think it's a little better but i think eh, for the most part i'm still not a big fan for movies so you know when i was covering uh movie mixes for home theater magazine and i would sit mm-hmm. with mixers working on movies and i noticed that they talked about among the four mixers you know the lead mixer dialogue mixer effects mixer and music mixer they talked about endless details of the sound the jangly the keys door slams you know car exhaust that they could go on forever but i said you guys almost never talk about surround this was in the early 2000s Mm-hmm. And they explained to me, well, Steve, we don't want to take the viewer's attention off the screen. <laughs> They're supposed mm. to look at the screen, not look over their shoulder. I said, oh, yeah, I see. Well, that was then and this is now. But I'm just saying that kind of stuck with me that, yeah, it should be the movie is the story, not the sound. isn't The, the, the sound should be there to support the story, not be the star of the show. Yeah. Well. But you know, it's an artistic endeavor, so people should do whatever the they want. Of course, think? yeah. I mean, is there is there some kind of rule that says, "Oh no, you can't do blah, no, blah, no because rules, blah blah, no rules, no rules, only right." Well, yeah, that's but like I can outlaw, still tell them to outlaw, get off outback my lawn. steakhouse thing. Um, <laughs> but but speaking <laughs> of rules, so I heard this demo of uh, 
The Doors, Riders on the Storm. Oh, which is yeah. really prime for Atmos because of the thunder and the rain. And, yeah. You know, it's not just guitar, bass, and drums, and keyboards. Mm-hmm. And what I found really interesting is, in addition to the spatial remix, the sound balances are completely different. I mean, wildly mm. different than the original. You know, that happened a lot with DVD audio, uh, where it's like the proportions of the song changed <laughs> like radically. I mean, you know, on the worst mixes. But you know what's interesting is I think I think Riders in the Storm was one of my first experiences with Dolby Atmos music, but it was not a Dolby Atmos mix. I went to a mm-hmm. CD Expo, and as I would always do, like the day before the show, I went to visit my friend Sandy Gross to see how he was doing with uh, cold near technology speakers. And he had his booth set up, and he was like, "Come in, come in! I want you to hear something." And I was like, "Okay." He was like, "I'm doing an Atmos demo this this year," and I'm like, "Oh, well, great, whatever." And he was like, "No, you've got to hear this." And he sat me down, and he started playing the CD of the Doors. Uh, hmm. writers on the LA woman playing writers on the storm, but it was the CD through Dolby surround up mixed into Dolby Atmos. Hmm. I gotta say it sounded pretty great, yeah. <laughs> really. And most of the demos that Sandy did of that show were just two channel stereo, but up mixed Atmos. And I think because the surround mixer could only get so aggressive, you know, it didn't have that a gimmicky effect, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I thought it was really, really wonderful and added a neat height element to the music and sounded, it was quite different from what you're describing, see, because the, the overall balance, you know, of the song was the same. It just, it was, it had just been expanded a little bit. So that's interesting. But when I, when hmm. I was listening to a bunch of stuff on Dolby Atmos for music, I kept thinking, this is imaging for people who never heard imaging before. You know, mm. most walking around normal human beings do not sit in the sweet spot and listen to stereo and are aware that imaging even exists, right? But with Atmos, yeah. you can't miss it. It's like, here, check this out. So it kind of raises their awareness, even if they're not paying attention. Do you think hmm. that's a good thing? If it was like training wheels and then they could go back and learn how to listen to stereo, <laughs> yes. Wait, wait, learn how to listen to stereo? Well, as in Why do you have to... sit equidistant from the left and right speakers. It's a tough, tough yeah. challenge, I know. But yeah. So, Brent, I got to okay. take you through memory yes. lane one more time. Uh-oh. When you were at Dolby, you yes. did a demo for me at a show, and it was like one of those fabricated rooms, a small room. Mm-hmm. Do you remember? So you, we, yeah, it was a sound, sound room like in a, in a, in a big... Uh, a big convention center or something, right? right? So it was a small okay. room, but set up yeah. with multi-channel, right? So we say our hellos, and you turn your back. I laid down. There was a couch, and I laid mm-hmm. across the couch. So my head was by the left surround speaker, and my feet were by the right surround speaker. And you yeah. turned around and said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm really tired. It's a tough show. Do your demo, Brent. And you said, you know, sit up straight. And I said, no, no. Brent, this is the way real people <laughs> listen to music <laughs> or watch movies. And that's the way real people do. They're not sitting bolt upright uh, listening for surround sound or immersive sound. Well, that's true. But it's, it, I, think, I think some of the surround sound stuff is inherently, you know, you, you have to be somewhat interested in what you're hearing. Now, people that, that want to flop down on the couch and watch a movie, well, yeah, people do that. But most people like I don't I don't maybe they do well, you're I don't do that well but but you know I kind of take the movie I, if I'm if the movie's not interesting I stop watching it and um, but if the movie is, is interesting I want to kind of get immersed in it and what better way to do that than with immersive sound and <laughs> um, <laughs> and a big TV um, but uh, I I I think that, look, the people who lay down on the couch should just buy, they should listen to the TV speakers or something. And, you know, look, the, how many people really have a sound bar anyway? How many people have a full surround sound system? Really not that many. And of those, and, how many I mean, people have Atmos? Even mm, fewer. Well, with sound bars a lot <laughs> well, now, because there's so many sound yeah. bars with Atmos. But I think that... And, you know, the people that are buying Atmos soundbars, yeah, the ones that are buying the $1,000 Atmos soundbars are, are 
you know, they, they have some sense of what they're buying and they're probably going to sit upright when they watch a movie. But the people that are buying a $200 sound bar or $300 sound bar that happens to have Atmos, they're not going to care. Yeah, they may lay on the couch and that's fine. However, you, Steve Guttenberg, mm, the are audiophiliac. the audiophiliac. And so I expect you to be a demanding listener. So I expect you to take it to, to not portray yourself as a champion <laughs> of Joe Schlub who goes to, you know, who goes to Costco and buys a $200 soundbar. I'm better now. But to be a champion of the people who are, you know, take this seriously, like your own, you know, how many, what do you have, like 200,000 uh, subscribers? Uh, 224, but who's counting? Yeah, well, <laughs> you yeah, are. Pretty <laughs> impressive. So, it's more than I got. Um <laughs> I think I have like five. But um, anyway, you know, so I think that once we talk on this, once we talk about audio gear on this level, we're assuming that people are not laying on the couch. If they want to, that's fine. And if the people that lay on the couch want to buy a better sound system, that's fine too. But, you know, I mean, my own family, other than my sister-in-law, has like zero interest in this stuff. And if it works, they're happy. And, and don't forget, it has to have enough bass. Yeah, not for my family. They they couldn't care less okay. about that. But for a lot of people, yeah, if it has bass, it's good. And that's you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, you go you don't go hear bands and there's like no bass. Yeah. Says you the know? bass player. Right. Unless I'm a bass player, but but you know, you don't unless there's no bass player in the band, you don't go hear you know and and if the bass believe me, if the bass player is not loud enough, the other band members will tell you to turn up. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. They want that there. They want that groove. And the audience wants that groove too. So anyway, we're we're diverting. We're getting a, so you don't like any Atmos sound through headphones? Uh I've never heard it. What? I don't have those uh at, you know Apple earbud thingies, which but is you the don't best you, but, but Atmos Atmos works through any headphones. It'll oh, work if through it works through any headphones, right I have I'm not impressed because I have tried it over headphones. Okay. Um, wow. Well, that's sad. Have you heard? Have you heard any of the Blue Note recordings that they remixed for Atmos? <laughs> You're, this is a joke, right? No. <laughs> no. What are you? What are, what are you laughing about? You hate them. I, I, I'm unaware, and I want to stay that way. <laughs> okay. All right. Look. They're, they're, look, some of them. Some of them aren't. Remember that great, my name. But what's wrong with candles? So. What's wrong with candles? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with a gramophone? Um, so check your needle. All right, there are some of those blue notes. So Blue Note invested a lot of money in doing, or, or maybe Dolby paid them. I don't know. They they just they invested a lot of time in doing uh, remixes of a lot of classic Blue Note records. And so uh, when this whole thing started to happen, I wrote an article about it for Jazz Times, and there was very little. You know, jazz is usually, usually like just about the last genre to adopt new technologies. So, but I talked to a couple of people. I talked to like Elliot Shiner and stuff and, you know, uh -huh. people who are technically savvy jazz producers. And Dolby, and I asked Dolby about it. And they said, well, look, come to our special theater because Dolby has a special theater in L.A. that is kind of incognito. It looks like an old theater that's been closed down, but it's actually a state-of-the-art theater. And they just use it for demos and, and for science stuff. So they go in there and they play me a whole bunch of music stuff. And, you know, over, it's a theatrical sound system, but still. Um, and some of the Blue Note mixes, there's one in particular of Wayne Shorter, and I can't remember the tune. It might have been Infant Eyes. And I just couldn't believe how much it, how, how much of a sense of the studio it gave you. It just sounded fantastic. It, and it didn't sound like you know, tacky stuff swirling around your head or anything like that. It just sounded like you were in what, and yeah, I've been in some of those famous studios and that's what it sounded like. Hmm. And I was really impressed with it. And now that's on their system. Now, when I played it on the Apple AirPods, what, what the, the big apples, the over-ear apples, Max. The, Mayor, the Max, yeah. Um, it was not as impressive, but it still sounded really good. But they're just, I think that, I don't know if this thing's going to take off and I don't, it depends on how much money people want to keep pumping into it because ultimately people are happy with stereo. But I do believe that 
eventually, if if they keep this thing going longer than, say, DVD audio and SACD, which died out pretty fast, thanks to Steve Guttenberg. I did my best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> then I think that mixers will develop a vocabulary that's good. I mean, you don't hear movie mixes and go like, oh, that's a terrible movie mix. I mean, they're pretty good. There's a vocabulary of what you do with surround sound in movies. There just still isn't really one with music because there's not enough of but it. that was my point from before that the thing of mixing music in in surround goes back to 1970 with or early 70s with quadraphonic and yeah. even by 2000 <laughs> 30 years later they still had no clue what to do with it no clue well most of them still just dabbled in it so yeah. you remember my story about um lyle lovett's record joshua judges ruth Great record. Mm, I don't remember it. You never heard that? Really nice record. I think I've probably heard it. It's very sparsely produced. Giant fan. And George Massenburg, great Mm -hmm. engineer, he did the surround mix. And one of the things that's an abomination, which is what I wrote about the surround mix, is that he put the piano in the surround speakers Mm -hmm. exclusively. So you got this giant piano stretched wall to wall behind you. So I did a review and I said, and that was the le- that wasn't the only problem with this recording. So I did this negative review and I called it an abomination. And you know, a year later I was at a show and there he was. And you know, he was doing he was a part of a seminar thing. And I walked over to him to say something to him. And I had forgotten that I called his mix an abomination. And he looked at my name tag and he stepped back mm-hmm. and he said, Abomination? <laughs> Oops, that hurt. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, you know, I had forgotten all about it. He apparently didn't. So, uh, no, mm. they haven't figured out how to mix around for for music, with very, very, very rare exceptions, and it's been around for a really long time. Well, fifty years since Quadraphonic, still no clue. Yeah. So why start? I now? did. I I did a review of the first surround remix of queens a night at the opera uh-huh. and it was a disaster of of similar proportions it was just wrong it was wrong in every way a surround sound mix could be wrong and i just trashed it and then uh someone at dts called me and they were like well we'll have you know that brian may sat in in my living room and approved this surround mix and i'm like well brian may was just wrong <laughs> <laughs> like, you know <laughs> um <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and the funny thing is they were pressuring me to take down the review and I would not take down the review. And then out of the blue, a week later or so, I get a call and it is from Brian May's assistant. And I thought I was being pranked at the time because mm-hmm. I'm just a nobody writer writing about DVD audio on a DVD website. And I'm just like, yeah, right. And she's like, no, really. I'm Brian, I'm Brian May's assistant. And he wants to know more about this surround sound thing because he had no idea that this was happening. <laughs> he had no idea it was being remixed. And it was oh like, that's my interesting. God. Because they told me that he sat in like this guy's living room and approved it. And they're like, he doesn't know anything about it. So then Brian May got involved and they did a complete remix in Surround Sound. And Brian actually approved that and one. Thank and you. they re released it. And it sounded pretty good. <laughs> it sounded pretty good. Wow. So thanks yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, thanks to Brian May. Well, if you had to, <laughs> but if you didn't speak up, this wouldn't have happened. So yeah, yeah I guess but the that. awareness among musicians is, I think, really small and yeah. always... I mean, I, I remember I interviewed Chris Squire, the bass player from Yes, one time about this surround sound project that Yes did, and he asked me more questions than I asked him. <laughs> and he was just like, well, these guys came to us and wanted to do it, so we did it, uh, but we don't really know anything about this. So what about... Blah, blah, blah. They just went. On. I mean, granted, I was on the phone with Chris Squire, so it was like the best day of my life, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say I it's a plus like, that he was curious. It shows he was interested. Yeah, he was curious. Then, then I guess they just dumped everything in Stephen Wilson's lap, where Stephen Wilson said, "Please dump this in my lap." And you know, Stephen Wilson, I, you know, I like some of his mixes, I guess, but uh, you yeah. know, people generally, I guess, seem to like them. I so, do, and I'm not a fan whatever. of whatever surrounding okay. general, but I like his. So I had a similar okay. one though that um, Jackson Brown's record, "Running on Empty." Mm-hmm. I don't know if you know that. Anyway, yeah, it's, we, we, yeah, yeah, we know that record. We've heard, we've heard of Good Jackson Lord. Brown's. Well, no, but yes. in that it's recorded 
some of it's recorded on the tour bus, some of it's recorded in hotel rooms, some of it's recorded yeah. in concert stages. So in terms of a demo for surround sound, it doesn't get better than that. Like every track, you're in a different environment. I said, mm. I want that. And they sent me a burned DVD because it wasn't, they didn't have a production ready. Mm -hmm. So I get this thing and I'm listening to the thing, you know, this is, this is, this is good. It's, it's got issues, but it's certainly in the right direction. And then they called me the next day and they said, you need to return that disc immediately. I said, why? And they said, well, Jackson Brown hasn't approved it because he hasn't heard it. And uh, we may make changes. So we want you to send it back. I said, you know, I could just destroy it. <laughs> It'd be easier than sending it back, but they wanted me to send it back, so I sent it back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was, let's say, in 2002. It didn't come out two or three years later. And by the time it came out, it didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But that, And I said, "What's what was the delay? Here's the answer, as I recall. Well, it took a while to get Jackson Brown to actually hear it. Yeah. Wow. It's hard He's to hear stuff surround to sound. Yeah. He's got stuff he can make money on. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, going and playing live and whatever Jackson Brown does, I, I, I don't know. Does he do that Not anymore? Much. Yeah. Sure. All those guys do. They make tons of money on the road. Well, that's true. Well, they're and not they making can, money selling records. That's for sure. No, of course not. But well, he's making money on streams from Spotify. That the, the <laughs> people like that are. I mean, that's why their their catalogs are selling for millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. No, I think their catalogs are selling so their music can be made into commercials and used in movies. Well, and, and that too. So he's no, he's clearly making. If look, if if there's a song that that all three of us can sing, that person's probably making money on that song now. True. That's valid. Yeah. So, so how about this band, The Beatles? <clears throat> You've heard of them, right? <laughs> I have heard. Yes, we have heard of them too. I think that was um, quite the segue. Well, it's yeah. Old music. So yeah. I do remember playing "Come Together" on the jukebox at the swim club across from my house in New Orleans in nineteen whatever year that 70. was seventy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty so, cool. Yeah. So this new version of Revolver. Now, I yeah. was tortured by an Atmos mix of Revolver at the recording studio where they had the press listening party. Hmm. It was mm -hmm. so many different kinds of awful. I, I don't, and it's not that the recording was awful. It's just the playback was awful. And oh. uh, it, was, it was not fun. And I couldn't leave. I mean, usually when I'm unhappy at a press thing, I just leave. But I felt yeah. I, can't, I can't do it at this one. So I just sat there and just took it <laughs> so but then when I, I when i listened at home to these stereo mix over cds which is what i got i really didn't like it because i th thought first just tonally it sounds wrong i've been hearing this music for a long time now and john mm -hmm. paul george and ringo's voices sound too different than what i'm used to hearing hmm. that was a big problem and i also felt generally it was it was too bright um and that the new surround, the new stereo mixes seem to make younger people who haven't listened to the other stereo mix that mm -hmm. much, they like the new mix because it sounds more like a contemporary mix, which is a good reason for them to make this new mix. Huh. Well, no, hang on. I'm a pretty old person, old. and I <laughs> I like a lot of the aspects of the new stereo mix. Yeah, no, I, I like shouldn't say exclusively. Instrument young separation. People, but, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just the tonal balance is all over the place. That's what bothers me about the new one. So. But here's the weird thing. So I got a promo of the five disc CD set, but mm -hmm. I didn't get the LP. So I bought the LP and it sounds surprisingly better. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the problems I have with it don't bother me nearly as much on the vinyl. And it's, it's all, it's 100% digital vinyl. It's the same thing, mm -hmm. but whatever i don't know why but i like it more so that was kind of strange wow well i'm gonna have to you know maybe i will maybe i'll subscribe to apple music before i before i go away for christmas and i'll i'll start listening to some of this stuff and in immersive sound and see what i think i mean i should be on top of this this is my job it's what the kids are so into. uh yeah it's what the kids are into um yeah. but anyway so you want to wrap it up guys yeah, let's Steve. Wrap it up. Me, I, Steve, I've we... said I've already said too much. No, <laughs> you haven't said enough. Uh -huh. But isn't that a line from some song? I can't remember. 
Oh, so we were going to say goodbye to Steve and thank him for being on. I mean, he is the biggest celebrity we've ever had and probably will ever have mm. yes, on this show. Thank you, Steve. And, uh, and it's been a delight. And we strongly recommend that you go to YouTube and, you know, search for Audiophiliac. Mm -hmm. And you will find years worth of Steve's videos. 1,300 videos. 1,300 videos. He is one of the most wow. popular audio commenters on YouTube for a very good reason. And that reason is... Good looks. He's not... He, there's that. I forgot about that. <laughs> but uh, the reason is he's not boring. So That's the best I can do is not be boring. Yeah. But I got to yeah. say, Thank Brent, you, Steve. that yes. video that you did about... Um, Apple earbuds or something, and they're noise yeah. canceling. You were mm -hmm. so good on that. So well, thank good. you. I'm going to be shocked if I don't you ever it. step up and have a YouTube channel to try to compete with me because I think you could blow me away. So. Well, you've been bugging me for literally five years to do that. Yeah. At least five yeah. years. Yeah. Well, but you got the talent. And maybe, maybe I will. Let's see if I can get. If I, I just got. I got to get my life together. That's my problem. But you know, I've been needing to get my life together for about thirty years now. So. <laughs> All right. Well. Well, again, thanks, Steve. It's been awesome. We're delighted to have you on. Thank you. This is fun. Okay, thanks, I feel Steve. right. You guys made me feel right at home on your podcast. Thank oh, you so much. Good. <laughs> thanks, Steve. All right. Bye. 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 We're back. This is a Soundstage Audiophile podcast. I'm Brent Butterworth. And I'm Dennis Berger. Yes. It's true. And we are, <laughs> we are here to discuss as our last topic, a review from Soundstage Simplify of the SVS Wireless Pro speakers, Prime Wireless Pro speakers. Mm -hmm. um, Dennis, you, I think, are a little more plugged into this category and perhaps even this particular product than I am. So can you tell us and perhaps maybe quote some of what Gordon Brockhouse said about them? Yeah. Um, what's so special about these speakers? Well, the original prime wireless speaker is a speaker that I love. Um, mm -hmm. It's an active uh, desktop speaker or bookshelf speaker, stand mount, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, has... PlayFi built in, which I'm not a big fan of that platform, but it doesn't really matter because you don't have to use it. But that adds yeah. a sort of a multi-room audio function kind of similar to Sonos, except mm -hmm. it's an open ecosystem. So you can you could have uh, SVS speakers in one room and an Anthem receiver in another and a Martin Logan wireless speaker in another room. And if, if they use the PlayFi platform, they could all function together as a multi-channel system or a multi-room wireless system. So um, yes. I have the original uh, Prime Wireless speakers. I use mm -hmm. them as my desktop audio system. Actually, mix um, the podcasts on them oh. when I when I do that. Um, but they are lacking in bass. You really have to add mm -hmm. a subwoofer to make them function. So the new Prime Wireless Pro um, adds a, a good bit more bass to where they are functional, um, well, usable without a subwoofer. I can't remember exactly what the low frequency extension on these. Uh, oh, let's see. Specified response is 42 hertz to 25 kilohertz, plus or mm -hmm. minus 3 dB, um, compared with 52 hertz um, to 25 kilohertz for the original. So that's yeah. substantially more bass. I mean, you know, 10 10. Uh, 10, well, you know, more base extension, 42. Well, it's a bigger product, too. Sure. It's not, it's it is not a like bigger they're product. just monkeying around with the guts inside. It's a bigger product. It's going to mm -hmm. have more base. Oh, yeah. They've added um, HDMI port with ER. Oh, really? Um, yeah, that's really, really cool. So you can kind of use um, these as like a sound bar. You could use these as a sound bar, which I think is just awesome. I think any sort of connected audio product these days that doesn't have HDMI... Well, they're they're yeah. getting a little left behind by the ones that are. Um, yeah, they need now, to start adding that. Complicated I am, as it might be. 
I recently wrapped up a review of the companion product to this. I think maybe it's going to publish in December or January. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. It's currently in uh, Doug and Diego's hands for measurement and f- photography, but it's mm-hmm. it is the Prime Wireless Pro Soundbase, which is a bit of a confusing name. A Soundbase back in the day we would think of as these gigantic deep soundbar substitutes with deep bass that you would basically set your TV on top of. Yeah product category that came and went but yeah. what svs is using the term to mean is basically an integrated amplifier that's got okay. all of the smarts of the of their active platform but you add your own speakers to the equation so mm-hmm. so yeah we've got gordon's review of this and we've also got my impressions of the new platform with the with the sound base um i think it's pretty cool I th- one of the things that gordon touched on that i think is really neat is the the old platform had presets that you could use like you could assign six presets um with the old prime wireless Wait, speakers, presets for I, what well i'm about to explain that okay so with the, with the old with the old speaker system the presets were activated by like booping a button and twisting it and booping it again but what they allow you to do is basically say well i'll just tell you how i use them right mm-hmm. like they're one through six and for me i arrange them in the order of the day like one is presets that i'd be more likely to listen to in the morning so when i press one it goes to my local public radio station so i can listen to mm-hmm. um the morning news right and you sort of get to the middle three and four maybe that's kind of stuff i want to listen to when i'm listening to lunch five and six are more like my well number five is a jazz playlist that i've been building on spotify based on recommendations you've been giving me and number six is my chill out or you know sort of calm down playlist Mm -hmm. so with the old platform it was really difficult to access these like i said you had to push a button twist a thing push another button i never used them with a new platform They've got one, two, three, four, five, six buttons uh, uh, like lined up across the bottom, and the remote also has those buttons too. So mm-hmm. it's the same functionality that they've always had. The difference is now you can actually use it. <laughs> That's a oh. pretty big deal, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I've had my prime wireless speakers for years. I use them every day. I've never used the presets, even though I set them up. New prime wireless pro. I was using them constantly. Like it became one of the primary ways that I actually interacted with the system rather than using the app. So I think that's really neat. And I think Gordon did a really great job of spotlighting that functionality and how it's changed and how he used it as well. So, yeah, and it's really kind of cool. It's like kind of like a, it's kind of like the old AM radios in your car where you have six push buttons for your favorite stations. Right. But you can say, you know, but but you can do whatever you want. Right. You could say, I, I want this button to be a Spotify playlist. I want this button to be a Spotify radio station. I want this button to be a specific radio station on internet radio, what have you. So you've got a lot of a lot of flexibility in terms of how you use them. Okay, really but the, cool. the question that I'm sure everybody wants to to know is here, can you set a button to directly access the soundstage audio file podcast? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh Gosh, I don't see why you couldn't do that on something like Spotify. Just go to the the SoundStage Audio File podcast, and then you you press and hold the button. It'll say preset saved. So sure, yeah, I think you could do that. All these all couldn't. all audio products should have that as default. <laughs> that should be the number Out one. Out of the button. box, they should play the SoundStage yeah. Audio File podcast. Yeah. <laughs> The other thing that's really cool is they've added functionality to make PlayFi even less of a necessity. They've added AirPlay 2. They've added Google Chromecast. So, I'm, oh gosh, I'm beating up on PlayFi here because I have a history of disliking PlayFi. I will say, though, these new products are one of the platforms that is benefiting from a big new PlayFi update that I get to play around with. I have to say it's getting better. It is getting whoa, better. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stop right mm-hmm. there. PlayFi mm-hmm. is getting better? It is getting better. Um, they're getting... They, well, they claim many it. people thought impossible. I know. They've gotten pretty close to gapless now. They claim they have gapless. They don't actually technically have gapless, in my opinion, because you can, like, if you're listening... Well, not if you're... Li- if I'm listening to a Grateful Dead live album, you know, before there would be, like, a second pause between tracks, right? Now, there's not that second pause, but there is a little boop, right? You can hear mm-hmm. a little a little digital boop between tracks that I wish would go away. It's there. It's very quiet, but I can hear it, and it's annoying. Yeah. 
Um, I still did have the networking problems that I've had with setting up PlayFi in the past. Like it would not connect to my five um, my five uh, gigahertz Wi-Fi network. Yeah, I kept trying, and it was like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. I do not see a five gigahertz. And then I tried my two point four, and it was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I went to try to stream high res to it, and it was like, man, you really ought to be using your five gigahertz. And it was like, but, but you won't connect to it. Yeah. <laughs> you won't connect well, to it. So, um, how many reviewers have had that? have have told the story yeah it has play fi and i tried to get it to work and i couldn't get it to work after <laughs> half an hour or an hour or whatever so i gave up gordon had better luck than i did he he apparently didn't have any problems with play fi this huh, time around wow. at least I mean, not not that i'm seeing in his reviews I, literally so. i have one of the i had one of the very earliest products like before they were really even licensing it and i couldn't get it to work and mm. the most recent PlayFi stuff that I tried to use, which is probably like a Philips soundbar, mm -hmm. I couldn't get it to work. Yeah. And I don't remember if I've ever actually gotten it to work. Um, I actually you know, got it to work this time. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. whereas you know, Amazon Alexa, almost always, Sonos, always. Um, you know, these other, uh, Apple AirPlay, these other systems just work. And mm -hmm. nobody wants to sit there trying different stuff randomly to and trying to think of new stuff to try to get their system to work i believe in the last playfy product review i did not the new svs stuff but the one before it i described the platform as a hair pulling fit pitching nightmare um yeah yeah <laughs> but so. you know we're still hey man we're still open to <laughs> the idea it always works in their demos yeah um, and it but is getting better, but like are, I said, yeah. you don't have to use it with these with these SVS speakers. It's like I, it's, yeah, sure. and and the sound base. It's like now it's almost like sort of a, I don't know, like a like an uh, an appreciated bonus feature, but not much more. The speakers have so much more functionality yeah. than that. You can use AirPlay, you can use Chromecast. Those actually work. At this point, I think the only thing you would really need Play Five for is if you wanted to do multi room with with components from other companies. So. Yeah. So I also wanted to talk about a somewhat earlier review that Gordon did on Soundstage Simplify of the Totem can play tower speakers, which are also speakers with amps built in. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, before about how, you know, powered and active speakers are becoming a lot more of a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the SVS is a company that has a, a sort of a reputation, a little bit like Harman, where they're very kind of engineering oriented and they yeah. kind of do everything super by the book. Whereas Totem is a company where the the founder and head engineer, Vince Brzezzi, kind of designs every speaker to have its own personality. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's very... Uh, it's a, it's a very kind of bespoke, boutique kind of uh, uh, brand. And so, like, every different Totem you get is going to be... I mean, every different model that you get from Totem is going to be a little bit different. And they, you know, they're... Okay, that's a, that's a way to do it. But it's much more of a high-end kind of thing. And yet, they're able to make a powered speaker as well mm -hmm. that espouses, you know, th th that embodies their aesthetic. So it's not like mm -hmm. these have to... It's not like when you get a powered speaker, you're throwing away all the sort of personal expression that you have as an audiophile because you know your your choices as an audiophile kind of say something about who you are at least maybe even just to yourself but um you know it's possible to have all sorts of different powered speaker systems that still have personality and are still interesting and aren't just sort of soulless things cranked out of some factory halfway around the world yeah so you you kind of hinted at something there that we've touched on before, but we might want to touch on again here and explain for people who are just getting into this stuff. We're talking about two speakers here that that plug into the wall that you have to have power. They've got built-in amplifiers, but one of them, the SVS, is an mm -hmm. active speaker. The other, the Totem, is a powered speaker, and there is a distinction to be made between those. So and what you, is it? You think we want to? Well, with the active speaker, basically it's it's you've got active crossovers. So this the signal simply put, basically the signal is being split and crossed over and then sent to individual amplifiers for each driver, right? That is active approach, that is the SVS. With the totem, 
your your signal goes into an amplifier and then goes out full bandwidth and goes into a passive crossover, which in this yeah. case, I think Gordon said was a second order crossover. Yeah. So, but yeah, it allows little, it allows Vince Brzezzi to continue with his art and craft of making mm -hmm. speakers without without really changing what he does. It's just that all of a sudden he's got an amp built in, but he's still right. building the speaker the same way he always has. Correct. Yeah. So it's interesting also to see the sort of approach in Gordon's reviews about <laughs> the different placement considerations. Um, and this is neither a good thing nor a bad thing, but mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, Totem has some, I would say probably maybe more specific guidance about how the speaker should be set up and positioned and things like that. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the approach that you were talking about before, where he's, he's building sort of more bespoke designs that, that yeah. uh, interact with the room a little differently. So, yeah. And you know, the fact that I think for a lot of people, the fact that they do require a lot of care and setup is actually more appealing. Mm -hmm. I mean, for a lot of people, for probably most people, it's not, but for audio enthusiasts, they kind of, probably want a product that needs a little care yeah yeah the kinplay so, tower also has a phono stage built in that's pretty cool yeah that is pretty cool and it just shows that you know they know their they know their audience and so yeah. you could do i think a, for a, <laughs> somebody was telling me like two years ago like some audio manufacturer was saying kind of like everything's it feels like everything's moving towards record players and bluetooth <laughs> and and the totem doesn't have any kind of uh, uh, you know streaming like a PlayFi or or or, or uh, AirPlay two or anything like that built in, but it has Bluetooth. It has Aptex HD Bluetooth, which is really good. And I seriously doubt anybody here could tell the difference between that and CD in a blind test. And because um, you know the the data reduction is really small, I think the data rate is five hundred and it's like five hundred and fifty kilobits per second. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. it's like five five seventy six actually I think and whereas CD uncompressed is fourteen eleven, and yeah. so it's only a three to one data. It's not even a three to one data reduction, and it's really 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 good. Yeah. So anyway, um, now of course you have to have something to that's compatible with Aptex HD to stream from, which could be your computer with an Aptex HD dongle, or it could be an Android smartphone that has Aptex HD. Are the, now you're an Android guy. I'm not, I'm an uh -huh. Apple guy in terms of mobile devices, not computers. I, I hate OS X, but I love Apple for uh, mobile devices. But so yeah. I'm, 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 I've got, you know, I'm baked into the AAC ecosystem for, mm -hmm. for Bluetooth codecs, but the, I seem to remember reading something about the Androids are moving away from, Aptex and more to LDAC is that have you noticed that or is that just a no. is that a misconception that? on my part Who I'm just seeing that? it more uh, I don't know maybe I was reading something from a headphone manufacturer that was talking I think it was Sony that was talking about like why they're using well because Sony makes LDAC okay well that's a good point that's a good point <laughs> that's like <laughs> us that's like us saying yeah the whole the whole podcasting thing everything's moving over to the soundstage audio file podcast that's all anybody <laughs> listens to anymore <laughs> well that's a true story though true <laughs> true <laughs> okay so no so you still got good aptex hd support and everything like that uh well it's th that's the whole this is a real big giant problem that i wish qualcomm could which is the you know licensor of Aptex HD and the company that makes the chips that have it. Um, I wish this, this is something I wish they could do because it's very difficult, at least with the Samsung phones that I've been using for a decade. Um, it's very difficult to tell what codec you're using. You really have to you have to go into like the developer options sub menu of the settings menu, and it's like way down. You, know, you scroll way, way, way down to the bottom, and then you hit that. And then you go into the, uh, it's really hard to find. And, mm. and of course, it's Samsung, so they change the location of it with every generation of phones. And yeah. so it's very, very hard to tell if you're actually, actually using Aptex HD or, or any other variant of Aptex. And I've had that problem with my headphone reviews, even using these dongles, which have a little light on them that say, at least the dongles I use have a little light that says what codec you're using. Yeah. Um, 
but the even, iFi stuff that I use has like the the iFi uh, Bluetooth receivers and also the iFi yeah. DAC that I use. They they change colors depending on the the codec. So that's cool. And you know the new the new uh, Focal Bathus headphones. I'm just finishing up reviewing for Soundstage Solo. Oh, so jealous. Um, they have uh, they have an app, and you know the app has like a fairly simple EQ, and it lets you adjust the noise canceling and stuff. But one of the neatest things in the app is it actually has a thing that says codec, and it shows you what codec it's using. So oh, cool, that's really great. But yeah, that's a big problem. Is that it's really hard to access these things. Uh, I'm sure that LDAC is really easy to access in Sony phones, but nobody has mm. a Sony phone, and so. Uh, I'm seeing but, it more frequently in integrated amplifiers, actually, that have Bluetooth built in. They'll they'll yeah. say, oh, here's your signal. Here's what codec you're using. That's so a good thing. That's a really great thing. And, and, and more people depth. should yeah. do that. But the phone manufacturers need to do it because – and they need to make it easy to access this stuff because why not? Mm -hmm. What are you yeah. hurting? Especially yeah. since – you can always make the phone default back to SBC, which is the standard Bluetooth codec. If it mm -hmm. can't find, you know, if the sync device, which is the headphones or the speaker or whatever, if the sync device doesn't have the codec, you're trying to shoot it, the phone can always look at that and go, hey, they don't have that. We're doing SBC. Too bad. Yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, at least be transparent about it. It's really, it's a, it's, I mean, it's probably more of a problem for me than anybody else in the whole world since I'm trying to do measurements of Bluetooth devices. Yeah, which is not something that a whole lot of people do. So, um, when's your review of the Focal anyway, coming? By the way, the Bathus. That's going to be in. Um, oh boy, I better finish those measurements because it's supposed to be tomorrow. Oh wow! Tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow excited. evening. Uh, the, tomorrow, as we record this, so that'd be November 9th, I guess. Yeah. Well, anyway, man, we uh, we should wrap this up. We've we been should. Going, we've been talking for a while, so we you have. want to do some credits? I do. So um, the let's just start with the music, and we haven't picked it out yet, but I'm pretty sure we're going to use a couple more cuts from my good friend Terry Landry, who's mm -hmm. in the process of of putting together his album of cool uh, tiki jazz stuff with really great arrangements and compositions, and uh, I know he's going to recruit some. Very awesome, top-notch LA players to to wail on this thing. So, well, who did the music in the intro and the music that we're listening to well, that right now? That's just me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. just just uh, don't <laughs> don't ignore yourself. Me. It's really good. Plug it into a Tascam. <laughs> kind of sound like Eeyore there, man. <laughs> Thanks for plug it into a Tascam, me. banging out some tracks, mixing together what I got. That's yeah. It. We um, should say we're a presentation of the Soundstage Network, which is a collection of nine microsites covering all sorts of topics and audio. And? And these, this podcast was produced by Butterburger Productions. That's the one. <laughs> That's Dang. us. Yes. So it was cool. mixed by one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that's it. Should we just say goodbye at this point? Let's do. Let's say goodbye at this point say goodbye and wish everyone a really happy week or day or month or whatever whenever you're listening to this yeah have a happy wish, that thing yeah happy that thing all yeah. right bye everybody bye